This is Teresa Whittington, and I'm in downtown Morgan Hill today. I'm going to be talking with George Brionis and also with Craig Cosson here at the exhibit of Chuck Jones's artwork. today with George Brionis. Welcome George, thank you for uh, letting me interview you. Thank you for having me here. Now you're with the Downtown Morgan Hill Association, or Morgan Hill Downtown Association, right? Right, the Morgan Hill Downtown Association. And you're the executive director? Yes, I am. And so what does that mean? Uh, what do you, well, let me ask you first of all, what, what is the association? What does it do? The Downtown Association, we ultimately are an advocate for downtown business owners, residents, and property owners. Uh, so we take the stakeholders of downtown and in a sense we can help them be a stronger voice uh, as it deals with landlord issues, as it deals with uh, things that may come up with the city uh, and, uh, and ultimately we try and enhance downtown to make it a exciting and vibrant place for people to want to come to and that, that's part of our mission statement. Part of our mission is uh, promoting downtown Morgan Hill is a vibrant place to live, shop, work, dine and play. We really focus on the 18 square blocks that are downtown Morgan Hill. Uh, it's, we work with several other organizations in helping them in, when they're doing their events, but the Downtown Association is kind of twofold. One is that advocate for downtown. The other one is one of the ways that we help promote and market downtown is we produce events. And we produce a number of events all throughout the year, and actually we're sitting in one right now uh, that is a temporary exhibit but is something that helps attract people to downtown that may not have come down here on an ordinary basis. And, uh, and hopefully they have a positive, unique experience that makes them want to come back. We do two downtown wine strolls, uh, one, that, well, one in the spring and one in the fall. And then we also have uh, the Thursday Street Dance Series, which takes place on Third Street um, throughout the through summer. Through the summer, yeah. Uh, we do the free outdoor downtown movie nights which take place once a month, June through October, uh, and that's at the Community Cultural Center in the Amphitheater. We do a downtown concert series, uh, which is once a month, also on Saturday nights uh, at the Community Cultural Center. Uh, we have the California Autumn Classic, which is a British sports car concourse event. Uh, so oh, you must love that. Oh, it's a great event. You're Just into cars, I know. Into cars, so yeah, <laughs> I, I do like that event. And we have over 200 classic British sports cars that are lining Monterey Road for that event. Uh, we also do a number of holiday things where we, we work with other organizations to do the decorations in downtown uh, during the holiday season. We have visits with Santa that we do during the holiday season. We also do the Safe Trick or Treat event right. in downtown. It's a safe opportunity, it's a controlled environment where uh, the families can come out, the kids can dress up, they can do their trick-or-treating, they meet with people from the downtown. Uh, we have uh, one of the local churches sets up a mini baseball stadium <laughs> in great. one of the intersections. And it's just, it's a really great fun time for the community kind of to come together. And that's one of the great right. things about Morgan Hill, it's such a community. The it's bands that you have come out, are they normally local bands when you play, what did you call that, the Thursday night? The Thursday Street Dance Thursday Street tends Dance. to be uh, local bands. It's a lot of bands that are from throughout the, the you know, kind of the South County area. Mm -hmm. um, and then with the concert series, we actually bring in touring bands that are touring either on a regional or a national level. What about the mushrooms? Do you have anything to do with the mushrooms that are downtown? That actually is something <laughs> that was produced by the Downtown Association. I love that. I love those mushrooms. Yeah, we get a lot of comments about the mushrooms. It's uh, The project is called Mushroom Art. and. Uh, we launched that actually in 2009, and uh, the, the purpose of that is kind of threefold. Um, one is that the mushrooms are each sponsored by local businesses um, or individuals or groups, and then those organizations or those sponsors, if you will, they work with a local artist. Ultimately, it goes on public display, and the sponsor also names a beneficiary, local nonprofit organization to be the beneficiary of that mushroom. And it will happen at some point is that we will have a public auction. And each of the mushrooms that are out on the streets right now, there's 11 of them that are out. And each of those mushrooms will go up for sale oh in no. public auction. And are they gonna leave them on the street though? Well, the proceeds <laughs> go back to the individual named beneficiaries in the name of the sponsor. And 
then whoever owns the mushroom can kind of work with where is it going ah. to wind up at. Oh, okay, great. Um, we have a lot of people that want those mushrooms to stay yeah, where they they're at. Yeah, they stay. And which is really them. neat to see that people really, because you know, they've really embraced them. such a symbol of Morgan Hill. I, I just love it. When I first saw them out there, I was all excited. Well, so is there anything else about the Downtown Association that anybody should know? Like, if I don't know, if they want to get involved or if they just want to be able to help in some way. Anyone that would be interested in, in finding out more about the Downtown Association, they can go to our website, which is morganhilldowntown.org. Uh, they can get a lot of information there. They can find out who the businesses are in downtown through the business directory. Uh, they also can find out about different committees and organizations or different times where uh, the Downtown Association holds meetings to, to talk about things specific to downtown, whether it's the Residence Committee or it's the Events and Marketing Committee, that type of thing. So we're in this space downtown that's temporarily being used for um, an art gallery, basically, for Chuck Jones's artwork. And I know we're going to talk with uh, Craig Cawson in a minute and uh, learn more about this whole display. But how did you, how did you come about, you know, uh, getting involved in this? How did the Downtown Association get involved in this project? A lot, you know, a lot of people ask that question because they say, well, where's the connection? Is, is Chuck Jones from Morgan Hill? I mean, mm -hmm. how did this all come together? And we were very fortunate that actually there's, there's a resident of Morgan Hill, Pamela Meador, who used to work at Warner Brothers. And got to know Craig and then ultimately got to meet Chuck Jones and became very, very strong, fast friends. And so that friendship, that relationship was actually brought to the Downtown Association last year by Pamela. She, she called me up one day and said, what do you think about this? And I said, I thought it was fantastic. It was a great idea. And, um, and so we worked together with Pamela and then the Chuck Jones Center for Creativity, which is down in Southern California, to bring the exhibit here last year. And it was, it was just so warmly received that both from the Chuck Jones Center and from the Downtown Association side, we wanted to do something again. Well, it sounds like Craig has some really interesting stories he's going to tell tonight. But, uh, you know, for you guys that are not going to be able to make it to the open house, we'll be talking to Craig in just a moment, and hopefully he'll share some of those stories with us here on the show. So uh, we look forward to meeting him and George. Thank you so much Thank for you. being here with me. And Thank you, uh, Teresa. next, I guess we'll go talk to Craig. back and I'm here now with Craig Cawson. Craig, hi and uh, thank you for coming today. I appreciate it. Hi, I am, uh, I'm ecstatic to be here <laughs> on this beautiful day in Morgan Hill. It is a beautiful day, isn't it? It really is. Well, um, you know, uh, I know you're going to be here anyway, but I appreciate you taking the time to sit with me and talk a little bit about the art and why you're here and um, you know, some people may not know the Chuck Jones name, but they're probably familiar with the artwork that he's created. So can you tell me a little bit about, you know, who he is and how did he kind of create these crazy characters that we know now? I, I can probably give you a little history about, uh, about Chuck, my grandfather. And um, like you said, most people don't really know his name, or many people don't know, although I'm finding out that more and more people do know his name. But when I bring up that he invented Roadrunner and Coyote and uh, was one of the fathers of Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck, the smile invariably just creeps across their face. And I can just see the memories popping up in their <laughs> heads. And invariably, the first thing out of their mouth, oh, I grew up with those characters. And that could easily be a 15-year-old or a 75-year-old. Because when Chuck made those cartoons, when he was working at Warner Brothers back, let's see, he started at Warner Brothers, uh, at least the studio that preceded it, uh, 1931, when he was 19 years old. Uh, and then went on to start directing in 1938 and created more than 300 cartoons in his lifetime and uh, was the father of uh, Roadrunner Coyote, uh, Pepe Le Pew, Marvin Martian, Michigan J. Frog, uh, just the kind of list goes on and on. And uh, you know, he did 250 films at Warner Brothers and went on to do things uh, at MGM with The Grinch and Dot and Line and 
I get exhausted just thinking <laughs> about it. But truly, 70 years of animation, and Chuck is the most prolific animation director in history. Memories pop into my head immediately when I go back to them, you know, sitting in front of my then black and white TV, giving away my age here, black and oh, white TV, you know, cathode ray tube <laughs> TV, and, uh, you know, just plastered to the screen every Saturday watching you these characters. You had those, those I did. cathode rays? The so cathode did cathode ray, yeah, That's did. right. It sounds like a Marvin Martian cartoon. Oh, it does, it doesn't really it? Does. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> What's your favorite character? Oh, oh, you know what? I liked, um, well, you know, I like Daffy Duck. Oh, But yeah. I, it has to be, well, I don't know. Oh, there's so many, but I really I like. I see it just popping up I all know, over I the know. place. It's such a beautiful thing. What was that little girl's name in The Grinch that stole Christmas with Cindy Lou Who. Oh, she's so yeah. cute. I'll, just, I'll tell oh, you, I'll so tell you a quick story about Cindy Lou Who that um, if you look at the book, and, and Chuck saw the book, the book was written in 1958, and Chuck saw the book and knew that it would be a brilliant film. And it took him a long time to sell the idea, both to Dr. Seuss, who they met in the war, uh, World War II making films, but to the studios that he wanted such a big budget, they said, no one's gonna pay for that, Chuck. And he said, don't worry about it, I'll find the money, which he did after 26 presentations to say, this is gonna be big. But that was 1965, and my sister was born in 1964. It came out in 1966. And in there, it refers to Cindy Lou, who was no more than two. Well, my sister was two at the time. Oh. Now, in the book, Cindy Lou Who was a little tiny bug of a character with no characteristics and whatnot. But if you look at the pictures of my sister and of Cindy Lou Who, they're identical. Oh, she had the same Bob blonde haircut, the same, same pink nightgown. We lost out <laughs> on the whole Grinch thing. My sister, yeah, but that's uh, all right. She, she, was the, she was too cute. She was little she then. Was How old were you then? I was four, so. Uh, oh, well, you were still cute. Yeah, but I didn't make the film, so. But it was, uh, yeah, he had a very, very prolific career. You're still cute, by the way. Well, thank you I very much. I don't want to just chop it off at four. Well, I, I kind of like you, too. <laughs> Why, thank you. Okay, we can cut that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. That's all, all of a sudden, I felt like Chuck there for a moment. <laughs> I did. All of a sudden, I just went, wait, what would Chuck say? Well, that's what he would say. I guarantee it. I, except Chuck would have gone, why, I kind of like you, too. <laughs> I would imagine that there were some unique. very memorable, unique moments at your house. You know, there, was, um, there were very memorable moments uh, with Chuck. And we had a normal upbringing. And uh, I remember Christmases with Chuck. That was always fun. We spent a lot of time at his house. You know, one of the, one of the earliest memories, talk about the Cathrode Ray Cathode television. Ray yeah, yeah. The, the televisions. Um, in 1966, he had done a film in 1965, right before he did How the Grinch Stole Christmas, and called The Dot in the Line. And it was a book by Norton Juster uh, that he had fallen in love with. And it's a very simple story about a dot and a line and the line falls in love with the dot. But the dot is in love with a squiggle who's very unkempt and is kind of a rock and roll and you know, very shaggy and whatnot. And a beautiful 10 minute story. And, uh, and it won the Academy Award in 1966. And so when I was four, watching my black and white television at home and uh, my mother is sitting there and I'm playing with my blocks and Here's the television on the rack, and all of a sudden, my mom starts screaming. And, and I didn't understand, and I look up at her in her beehive hairdo, which was <laughs> appropriate at the time, and she's just screaming, and I look over, and here's Chuck walking down the aisle at the Academy Awards in black and white. Obviously, it's the only thing winning the Academy <laughs> Award, and it was one of the earliest. It was three, actually, at the time that he, he received that award. And it's still indelible in my memory and I tell you, the add-on to that, that, that you're the first person I've told, I was up at the Motion Picture Academy only two weeks ago, because there's an exhibition that was going on uh, there at the time, and they have all the footage. Well, I look across as I'm, I'm bringing a group of ardent uh, Chuck Jones fans in to view this beautiful exhibition, similar to what we've got here. In fact, there's a lot of pieces that were in that ex exhibition here. Um, and I look over and here's a television, a huge television with a color version of that. And it was the first time I've ever seen it in color. <laughs> and I stopped midstream 
And you know, these 50 people thought I maybe was having a heart attack, but <laughs> I, was, I looked all the way across, and I immediately stormed over there and replayed it again. And here is the first time I've ever seen it in color. And it just brought back all these memories, the first time I've ever seen it since. But it was exactly like, except now it had color. Oh, it's like it had been cool. colorized by Turner or something like that. But right. it was perfect. So do you know how did he come up with the characters? Did he, did he make them up from scratch, or did people give him inspiration, the writers maybe? Or did, you know, how did that come about? Do you know? Yeah, you know, um, and I've heard, I heard him ask those questions quite often in you know, sort of where do the characters come from? And, and it was always the same answer. They come from inside of him of who they are, that there's a little bit of Daffy Duck and maybe in more of us there's a lot of Daffy Duck and <laughs> hopefully you get a, a snippet of Bugs Bunny. But, um, you know, he always said that, uh, that you know, he, he dreamed of being Daffy Duck but when he looked in the mirror he saw, I mean, he dreamed of being Bugs Bunny but then when he looked in the mirror he saw Daffy Duck. And so, you know, there was always that sort of tear between what he wanted to be. Mm -hmm. and what he thought he really was. Up until three months ago when we were curating one of the Center for Creativity shows, came across a letter that he wrote to my mother when she was in boarding school that said they were working on Roller and Coyote. It was dated 1947. All the history books written have said that they started working on them in 1948. So oh. a little known fact, he and Mike Maltese were talking about chases because everybody was chasing. The Keystone Cops were chasing and, and Abbott and Costello always had chases. and. And so they wanted something that was a little different. And Tom and Jerry had chases going on. And so they decided Chuck used to go out to Arizona all the time and would see the, the uh, roadrunners chasing each other around up under the sorrel cactuses and come, you know, flipping to a, to a stop on the top. And, you know, they had more things in mind, either territory or <laughs> right. whatever. But the, um, uh, Chuck had remembered a character that he read about starting when he was seven years old he read Mark Twain's Roughing It. And he was, a, he was a voracious reader and started reading it at three and read Roughing It many, many times. But there was a description there that he remembered from the time he was seven when Twain was coming across the plane in, uh, in, this, in the wagon and they'd stop. And here's this, the description of a coyote. And it's this long, slim, sick, and sorry-looking skeleton with a gray wolf skin pulled over it. He says that you know he is the allegory of want, and that you know a a uh, a flea would desert him, you know, to for a velocity. I mean, it just this whole paragraphs of description, and you think about it, and that is the coyote. And Chuck was inspired by that when he was seven, and knew that at some point that he'd probably use that. When and he was it seven. And when he was seven, and so that was the inspiration for the coyote. It came from inside of Chuck. And since we all have such common traits, that you're right, it, it really just pings inside. And I think that's the same reason why they're so timeless. Mm -hmm. Because it, there was nothing ever put into the cartoons that was of the time. Right. Because they really never knew when they were going to be released. The director was the king of his fiefdom. I mean, he had a writer, and, and many of the stories were written with uh, Mike Maltese, and they'd work on the stories together, and then they'd get a bunch of the other writers and directors together to talk about the stories, to elaborate on them. The producer really had no idea. And the producer, like his name was Eddie Selzer, when it went to Warner Brothers, after Leon Schlesinger sold the studio to Warner Brothers in the early 40s. And Eddie came in and, and really had no clue what it was. In fact, he once said, uh, he told everybody when he came in, he said, I want to see all the scripts. Because that's what, uh, that's what uh, Harry Warner wanted to do. You know, say, show me all the scripts. Well, there's no scripts in cartoons. There's storyboards, there's whatnot, but he demanded to see all the scripts. But, uh, so Eddie, being Eddie, would storm in to the, to the story room to find out what was going on. Well, unbeknownst to him, they had rigged up a little uh, switch at the entry, right at the desk near the entry, and they would flash a light inside the story Eddie's room. Coming. Eddie's coming. <laughs> now, you might think that they might get to work, just the opposite. <laughs> they would all be working, they'd see that flash, and they'd all take a pose somewhere on a table or, you know, smoking a cigarette, <laughs> head down, sleeping, somebody else. And Eddie would come in, and no one would move. And he'd look around the room, and there was just, and he'd get so angry, and he'd storm out and go back to his office, and they'd all go back to work. And an hour later, he'd come back again, and the 
<laughs> might flash. And they would strike a different pose and whatever. And in the meantime, all these storyboards had magically appeared around the room. <laughs> and it would drive him crazy not knowing exactly how it all happened. You know, when Daffy first started with the early Bob Clampett and, and some of the Tex Avery films, he was very crazy and he jumped around and he said, Hoo -hoo, you know, it was just <laughs> wild. But as he evolved and got more personality, they decided they needed a new voice. And so Leon Schlesinger was the original owner of the studio and very wealthy man, great businessman, paid his people nothing and demanded everything, <laughs> like everyone would. And, uh, and well, Leon had a list. So <laughs> they were looking for a voice, and, and somebody said, well, how about, how about Leon's voice? And they said, asked Mel if he could do it, and he said, oh, a third guy, they can do that. <laughs> well, they went through the whole production of this thing, and about three quarters of the way through the production, they started to figure out that Leon's going to see this. <laughs> and you know, he never got involved in any of the production until at the end of each film, they would go in, and they'd have the screening room, and the, all the minions, as Chuck said, all the, the people who work there, they'd all sit on these benches, these wooden benches, as uncomfortable as could be. And Leon would come in, and they had, from one of the, the old, uh, like Ben-Hur or something, that they had this throne. And Leon would come in and sit down <laughs> on the throne. And, and, he, and literally, he would say, roll the garbage. <laughs> and I've, seen, I've heard Chuck tell that all so many times. Well, they had all figured that here's this new Daffy Duck, and uh, they were all going to get fired. So they, they wrote out all their resignations and brought them to the session, all cowering as there. <laughs> yeah. And they get done with the film, and, and uh, dead silence. Everybody knows this is the moment. And Leon turns, and he goes, Jesus Christ, where'd you get that voice? That's a great voice, guys. <laughs> <laughs> They all right. slowly put away their resignations, <laughs> and I don't think he ever got it. Oh my God, that's great! <laughs> Total parody, but <laughs> now you asked me what my favorite character was. I did. Um, do you have a favorite character? Hmm. You know, I I don't know if I have a favorite character. Um, I always I always thought that Roadrunner was my favorite because he was always such the winner. But when I really, as I got older, I started to realize that. The Roadrunner is pretty boring. Really, is not even in the film that often. Everything in those cartoons is about the coyote. Uh -huh. And so, you know, I, I, I think I've got an affinity towards uh, the coyote. I, um, I, you know, it's all about trying too hard. And, and, you know, really, he just wanted lunch. So he did a, more than just animation. He did uh, more traditional art, right? Yes, he did. You know, he, he started off. Uh, with traditional fine art, and he was classically trained at Chouinard Art Institute in Los Angeles. Later became Chouinard, or later became Cal Arts. But um, Chuck went there from 1927 to 1930, and really, n the animation industry really wasn't existent at that time. And so he really envisioned himself going to Paris and, you know, painting and, and as he said, you know, dying at a at a an old age of 37 or something <laughs> like that. You know, and. Um, uh, but as he came out, it was just the end of 1929, and the stock market had just crashed, and he needed to eat, feed himself. Mm -hmm. And so he anticipated that he was going to get some sort of job like a janitor or whatnot, and because there weren't any you know, paid fine artists around. But, uh, so he stumbled around for a while and drew caricatures of, uh, on Bel Paul Vera Street for a while. And, uh, worked in other jobs, but stumbled into, uh, saw a job uh, in the newspaper for a cell washer. And uh, as he said, I thought I was going to go work in a prison. Which <laughs> 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 I always thought was good. But literally in those days, in the early 30s, it was, it was less expensive to pay somebody to wipe the ink and the paint off of the acetate that you do, that you create making the animation, than it is to buy the new eight cents for that oh, piece of wow. acetate. Throughout his career, um, Monday nights were Chouinard nights, and he would go into master classes and continue to, uh, to draw, life drawing and painting, and, and really that passion that he had continued. He never stopped drawing and never stopped painting his entire life. Let me just talk, because you were mentioning earlier about the Chuck Jones Center for Creativity. Mm -hmm. What's that all about? <laughs> 
Well, you know, the Chuck Jones Center for Creativity was uh, formed 11 years ago, and it was really an inspiration of wanting to create an environment and a way that, that Chuck's teaching, Chuck's understanding of creativity could be, uh, and I don't want to say passed along because you can't really teach creativity. And so what I learned and what we learned from Chuck is that everybody has creativity inside them. Every, every single person, it's there, but most people have forgotten it. So the entire mission is to inspire the creativity that exists in everybody. We do educational programs, creativity programs. We do exhibitions like this. Um, you know, our exhibitions just in the last two years have been seen by approaching a million people. And we've got uh, over uh, a thousand young, well, I just I couldn't call them children anymore. They're young geniuses who come in and some of the things they come up with, um, and we don't teach them. We give them guidance on if they get frustrated, but it really is an opportunity for them to do something without being told what to do. And many of them, for the first times in their life, they look at you and say, what do you mean? <laughs> you, you're not going to tell me what to do? Mm -hmm. And it usually takes about an hour before they go, this is great. <laughs> and the inspirations that come up and some life-changing opportunities have happened for young people that their parents have talked about. And, and so as it grows, we get more and more uh, into more and more communities and uh, the exhibitions go more and more places. We're, we're blessed to be able to come back here for the second year in a row. And, yeah. Hopefully we'll come talk again, yeah, you know, the next five, you. ten years every yeah. year. Morgan Hill? Maybe. Absolutely. That's awesome. Oh, it could be. I think it, it, it could be the basis for uh, drawing everybody from Northern California and beyond to Morgan Hill. Well, maybe if you come back next year, which we hope we do, I can spend a little more time with you and we can hear some more interesting stories and uh, I would you know, love learn that. more about you and more about your grandfather. and everything else that's going on. I would love to do that. So thank, thank you so you much. So much.